Well, good afternoon. Uh, this is Comp 422 and Comp 620 again. And today we're talking about network security. We'll also talk about how networks operate for those of you who may have forgotten since you took a class on this. Okay, uh, reminder, next Monday is uh, beginning of registration. By now you probably should have seen some information on what classes are available next semester. Graduate students and seniors can register Monday. Uh, I recommend that you always register as soon as you're allowed because things sometimes fill up. Now, graduate students, senior classes, I must. This stuff closes November, right? Yes, closes November 20th. Now, if you don't register by then, you can register later, but they will charge you a late fee. Oh. So, uh, uh, $50 doesn't mean when, anything to when you. Is it, when is the free period of registering? now until November 28th. But by then, they can shut off registration, they turn it back on, I think in January, with a $50 late fee, or a, I think the late fee is $50, but I'm not 100% sure. Anyway, yeah, you can avoid the late fee by doing it now. Uh, again, talk to your advisor. Uh, who advises the uh, certificate students? Anybody? Oh. The certificate students. Any, any certificate students online that can tell me who advises them? Apparently not. Okay, well, maybe nobody. Uh, and again, if you're taking courses, always be mindful of prerequisites. If you you know look down the line at what classes you're going to take and see if there are prerequisites for it. In the graduate program, there's an awful, not an awful lot of prerequisites, so it's not too much of a problem. Okay, a little history of networking. Uh, <clears throat> networks have been around for quite some time, way back in the uh, end of the 18th century, Claude de Chappé developed this optical telescope. Here's a picture of what it looks like. It uh, has a, a couple arms on top of a tower. The towers were on hills, so one tower could look through a telescope and see the other tower and see how the, uh, the semaphores were turned, and they represented different letters or common words. And since we're talking about computer security, uh, in the book, The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas, Dumas uh, and there's several movies about it, at some point along the way, he bribes a telegraph operator. I remember in the movie, he comes along and asks the telegraph operator, how much do you make in a year? I says 10,000 francs. And he throws him a bag and says, this is 20,000 francs. I want you to send me a message. <laughs> And so, yes, he sends a false message down to the network. So it's been happening for centuries. Okay. Uh, yeah, in 1844, Morse developed the uh, telegraph. And then, uh, was that 30 years later, uh, Alexander Graham Bell, by the way, has nothing to do with Alexander Graham Hall next door, but Alexander Graham Bell invents the telephone. Uh, and it keeps going. Uh, internet. Uh, the ARPANET, which was the uh, precursor to the internet, it was uh, developed primarily for a few uh, Department of Defense schools and Department of Defense agencies. They connect together at a whopping 56 kilobits per second. Um, Ethernet was thought up in 1973. Uh, the TCP algorithm came out in 74. Uh, and it became the standard for the internet five, uh, no, or is that seven years later? So it moved through. Uh, name servers, we talked about that, 1983. Actually, I don't know what they did. 1981 to 1981, 1982, I don't know what they did without the name servers, but they probably figured that. Actually, I kind of do because I used a precursor to the internet. I mean, I'm old, right? Remember, it wasn't always there. Uh, we use other networks and they were uh, source routing. So it's network headquarters sent you a file every week. It's like, here is the routing table, the huge predetermined routing tables for the network. And you load them in your system, and that's what you used. Uh, and then uh, Internet Engineering Task Force, which pretty much operates the internet these days. And then the World Wide Web was created by Tim Berners Lee in Europe uh, in 1991. And then in 1992, I graduated with a PhD in the area of networks. And you can see, what did I know about the web? Absolutely nothing. 
Okay, uh, when you talk about networks, almost everybody has to start with network layers. This is the ISO Open System Interface or ISO OSI. Uh, it has many layers. That, uh, starting at the bottom, the physical layer is these standards or describes how things connect together. Right? And then data link layer describes how you're going to send a packet from one side to the other, what the packet's going to look like, what's the format, you're going to address them. The network layer takes care of a routing, how to get packets across the other network. Transport, transport is the first end-to-end. -end. There's no inter an intermediate, doesn't deal with the transport, it just packets come down, you know, you write your programs at the top, you give it the application layer, which gives the presentation layer, which gives the session layer, which gives the transport layer, which gives the network layer, which gives the data link layer, gives the physical layer, which squishes across, goes back up to the data link, up to the network, figures out how to route it, sends it down another link, and so forth. It's amazing that it ever works and it gets there efficiently. But that's how it operates. It does, in fact, work. Uh, transport talks to the other transport layer. Now, the session and presentation layers mm, often don't really exist. Uh, this is the OSI model. It's been kind of superseded by the internet model. And the internet model, the lower two networks are merged or layers are merged together because the internet layer doesn't care about them. It just says, and then the transport drops out the presentation, deals with the application layer. It's a simpler model, pretty much the same concept. I understand the model. I, I, I like this analogy that I stole from another textbook. I, and a bomb, I think. Well, okay, by somebody. Anyway, uh, imagine you're sending a letter to somebody. Uh, you give the letter to the post office. The post office gives it to the airlines. The airlines fly it over to some other city. They give it to their post office, and their post office puts it in the mailbox of your friend. You don't have to know where in that foreign city they live. You just know their address, and it will get there. The, their post office has to know that. The post office. Uh, uses the airlines. The post office doesn't have to know how to fly planes. That's not their business. When they have something going on, they just contract with the airlines. They give a mail bag to the airlines. The airlines flies it to wherever they say it's supposed to go, and then they give it to the post office in that sense. So each layer relies on the layer below it to provide some functionality to do this. Uh, as things go on in the network, everybody's adding headers. You have your data, you give it to application layer, which puts its headers on, and then the transport layer puts their headers on, and the network layer puts its headers on, and so forth. Sometimes they even put uh, trailers on. Okay. Trailers are usually there to help uh, make sure the message arrives correctly. There are error detection systems. So okay, it's big. And then as it goes back up the stack, each layer rips off its header and gives the rest of it to the layer up above it. Oh. And so packets go across the network, bouncing from network to network to get across the internet. So you send one and then it puts a header on it, sends it across, gets to the next interface between networks, it rips that header off, figures out where to send it because usually routers have a decision point. They can send it over here or they can send it over there. And they make that decision, send it down that wire or cable or, or wireless, wherever it is, doesn't matter. Yeah, again, wireless, and all these things, it's physical layer. We don't care how it gets there, it just gets there. And they keep wrapping the packet you have in other layers. There are multiple ways to connect networks together. Um, primarily, at the low level, we have repeaters. At the data link layer, we have bridges. And at the network layer, we have routers. And they are significantly different in how they function and how they are used by the network. Repeaters, which are at the lowest layer, the hardware layer, uh, they copy every bit that comes in from one side, goes out to the other side. Um, sometimes it amplifies it, it's going a long way, it might need amplification, uh, cleans it up in a bit if the, if the bit is kind of noisy and it, it does its best effort to figure out what the, whether, well, whether it's zero or one. Because sometimes signals vary, it's a clear bit. All you have to do is say, yes, zero one, and it transmits it cleanly as a zero one on the other side. Now, repeaters are invisible to the source computers. The computers in the network do not see a repeater. You don't know that a repeater is there. You just send something on the network and it flows through the repeaters. The repeaters send anything that comes in one side, goes out the other side. So it's just invisible. 
and Ethernet, you can go to 1500 meters, but no more than four. Well, yeah, okay, that's not important, but it's a fact. There are hubs. Hubs are repeaters. Uh, hubs typically are a little box. These are the easy way to plug the stuff together at your home. You have a bunch of things connecting together. You can plug them into a reader. And when, you know, in this case, I guess there's three going in, one coming out, and away they go. And again, any bit that comes in goes out the other side. And of course, because they are the simplest of box, they are the cheapest. The next layer up, you've got things called bridges. Bridges operate at the data link layer, sometimes called the media uh, access control layer, or MAC. Uh, they receive a packet, check to see if it's supposed to go to the other side, and then send it to the other side. So it receives it and then retransmits on the other side of it. You know, again, talking two uh, networks, one comes in, one goes out. Now a bridge, pretty simple, one in, one out, goes the other side. Uh, again, it's invisible to the computers on the network. You don't know if there's a bridge there, you send something on the network, and if it happens to belong in the other, there's destination is on the other side of the network, it gets there, no problem. Now, bridges only forward the frames that need to go to the other side. And it figures this out automatically. You don't have to tell them. It simply watches the traffic going across the network. Or, yeah, going on. So if you have network A and network B, if A1 sends a message to A2 and A2 replies back to A1, the bridge goes, oh, A, one and A2 are on this side of my network. And again, you know, B1 and B3 talk to me because they'll be on this side of them. So if a computer on the A side sends a packet address to B, it goes, oh, B1, I goes, I know B1's on the other side, but copies it across. But if it sends one to A2, it says, I don't need to copy it across. I know that that destination is on the side. There's no need to copy it. Of course, it makes mistakes. At least the first time it always makes a mistake. But then it learns where the other computers are and eventually has a pretty good list of what belongs on what side of the network. This can be poisoned if somebody starts advertising themselves as being somebody else. Now, well, we'll talk about but these operate on uh, hardware level addresses. The hardware level addresses are usually built into the hardware, which is why we call them hardware addresses. But some systems allow you to change them. And if you, you could change your addresses and spoof one to think, ah, oh, I'm I'm on the you know, I'm on the A side, I could start sending and receiving as if I'm on the B side. And so when you actually send somebody to the B side, they won't get there because the bridge thinks B all oh, I've seen B packets on this side. Uh, routers. Routers are on the third layer. They are on the network layer. Routers also receive and forward packets uh, just like a bridge does, but a router can be connected to different types of networks. You could have different networks. You have an Ethernet connected to a wireless network connect or connected to uh, any of the other network architectures you might have. I'm not going to go through them because that's, this is not a networks class, and it will convert from one format to another. The routers are visible to the network. That is, the computers on the network must know that the router is there and must send packets to the router intentionally in order to get them someplace else. Uh, some of those routers are called gateways because again, their purpose is to connect one network to another. The internet is basically connected together by routers, shipping packets all. And routers also make networking decisions. The repeaters don't do anything. They just send any bit that comes in, goes out the other side. A bridge does a little bit of decisions, only pa passing those packets that need to be on the other side. But a router, has to decide, how do I get this packet to its destination? It doesn't have to know the complete path. It just needs to know the next hop. If 
this is going to go someplace. Which direction do I send it? Now you can have hardware routers and they're pretty popular. You can buy these things, by the way. Uh, I think I have something well, similar to that at my house where we plug it in and it does wireless and connects my ethernet together and that sort of stuff. Uh, you can also have them, you can also make a router out of computers, uh, regular computers. You have to have two network cards or three or four network cards. Uh, Windows Server, Linux Server, both uh, have the software to function as a router. And again, the ones that are used on the core of the internet operate at very high speeds. They are hardware devices. They're probably pretty darn expensive. Okay, first question for today, a poll question. So let's uh, let's launch that question. And the usual, the usual culprits. The, must have given you one beginning of the semester. Please find it by the end of the semester. I'm gonna want it back. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, there we go. Okay. All right. Uh, here in class, let's see. Oh, yeah, got to hold it up so I can see. Get your fingers off. Okay, there you go. Oh, got yours too. All right. Uh, all right. Well, there are several answers for C. Alas, C is not the right answer. A hub is a repeater, and repeaters operate on the physical layer. So the correct answer is A, physical layer. If we just, real quickly, hub. A hub is a repeater. The repeater. Therefore, repeaters operate on the physical layer. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Any questions about that? Again, they come in all sorts of, uh, all sorts of ways to do that. Again, one of the biggest issues is visibility. Okay. Uh, one of the biggest issues is visibility. A router can be seen, but a bridge and a repeater are not visible. When a computer on the network wants to send something to the internet, you want to send something off to www.acme.com, well, you look at your IP address. And the first part of the IP address indicates what network in the second part or least significant bits tell you which computer on that network. So you separate it into the network identifier and the host identifier. And if the network identifier of where you want to send it is the same as yours, well, then it's on your network. You just send it. If though it is not on your network, then you send it to your uh, router. When you start up a computer, it usually goes out and says, who is my router? And it finds out where the routers are, maybe one. You're on a campus, maybe it's only one choice. So you're in a building, you wanna get out of this building, there's a router that doesn't. If that's broken, well, then you don't connect. Although often there may be backups or you may have different routes around campus or around the world. So computers, when they send a packet, have to make a decision as to where to send it. They have to send it to the router, which will then forward it on to the final destination, eventually, hop by hop. There are three different types of identifiers for the computers on the network. And it's important to understand the difference between them. Uh, there's internet names like www.acme.com. There are alphanumeric characters. They're separated by periods, and they're intended for humans' use. Uh, of course, sometimes you just 
click a link, but underneath it, there is a identifier like that. The internet names are for humans, but the network does not use that name to send packets around. It uses the internet address, a binary value, 32 bit value, usually written as four decimal numbers separated by periods. On ANT, all the computers on the network that are visible outside start with 152.8 dot a number dot a number. And of course, dot a number dot a number depends on which uh, computer you are on the ANT campus. And again, that 152.8 tells you it's on campus. If you're sending a packet to another 152.8 network, you go, oh, it's your campus. I can just send it. I don't need to send it to uh, the router. And then there are hardware addresses. For Ethernet, which is pretty popular, oh, uh, hardware addresses are 48 bits. And I'll think I, yes, that's coming up. Uh, okay, and then there are different ways, different ways to map between these addresses, because humans use the internet names, but the hardware uses the physical layers. The hardware uses those physical addresses, and that's all it can use. It cannot use the names. It does not use the internet addresses. Uh, so you have to convert them. To convert for internet names, the human version, to the internet addresses, which are used for the internet, you have to use a domain name server, which we'll talk about in just a minute. And the, in order to convert the internet addresses to the hardware addresses, which you need to actually send the packets across the network, you use the address resolution protocol, or ARP. Uh, about Ethernet addresses, and every device has its own address. The MAC addresses are built into the device, and they're all unique for each device. And yeah, I, this one, there's a MAC address there, and another MAC address there. Yes. How many different possibilities are there for MAC addresses? Well, there's 48 bits, so it's two to the 48. Oh. Big number. Now, the number of available addresses. Is an issue you know, for the internet. And we'll talk about that near the end of class today. At, at that, but that's an important issue for Ethernet. Now, you think it'd be a, pro a problem because every vendor has to make devices with a unique address. All the internet cards, all the chips that they make for network, each one has to have a separate address that's unique from every other Ethernet in the world. So you can plug it into any network, and it has a unique address. And they do this. With Again, the upper so many bits find the vendor who made this thing, and then the lower bits is serial number for that device. Again, uh, Ethernet addresses are uh, 48 bits. They're usually written as 12 hexadecimal digits. Remember, there's four bits in a hexadecimal digit. And again, they're all unique. There is a broadcast address built into this. If you send something to the broadcast address, the network will send it everywhere, sends it to all computers on the network. Broadcast addresses will go across repeaters and they'll go across bridges. Because by definition, your broadcast is supposed to go everywhere. So the bridges and, and repeaters send it everywhere. A router does not. Uh, again, MAC addresses are necessary for the hardware. The Ethernet card uses 48-bit MAC address. It has no concept of an internet address or internet name in it. So if you're gonna send a packet to a computer out somewhere else in the internet, uh, you know, again, www.widget.com, then since you're not on the widget.com network, your computer will have to send it to your router. And in order to send it to your router, it must use the router's hardware address. So you address the packet with the internet header going to www.widget.com, but the hardware address going to the router. So when you dump it in the ethernet, it goes to the router, the router gets it and goes, oh, this isn't for me. This belongs to www.widget.com and using a routing scheme figures out where to send it and sends it on to the next hop. To figure out what, your, what address you have, where the hardware addresses are, there's the address resolution protocol or ARP or ARP. 
And again, that it uses to find the physical address, sometimes called the media uh, access control or MAC address. MAC addresses and physical addresses are the same thing. And it uses it to send packets on the same network. You never know what the MAC address is of a packet on somebody else's network because their network may be different. They may have a token ring network and you have an ethernet and somebody else have an FTDI and all the addressing schemes are different. You only worry about the ad physical addresses on your network. Uh, and so to find a MAC address, broadcast a request saying, who has IP address so-and-so, given an IP address and send out, and it's broadcast so it goes to all local networks. And then the one that has that address replies and says, here I am, this is my MAC address. And now it knows the hardware address and then can send it to that one. It knows not to do an ARP for our computers that are not on its local network because by separating out the network ID and the host ID, you can see if the network IDs match. And if they don't match, it knows to send it to the router. If it does match, you go, oh, it must be on my network. And I got to go ARP to find it. So broadcast out and the computer whose address matches replies and says, here I am, here's my hardware address. Of course, there's always that problem that it wasn't the computer who actually has that IP address response, but some malicious computer responds and says, oh, I'm that computer. And so your computer goes, oh, okay, got the hardware address. And now when it goes to send something to that address, it's sending to the hardware address of the attacker, the one that reply with the incorrect MAC address. So the victim thinking it's sending something to the appropriate address sends it off to the wrong place. That's one of the many ways to do it, yes. Uh, yes, wireless, wireless also has a separate layer of encryption, which we'll talk about, but not today. It's, although the separate layer of encryption, well, there's many different encryption schemes they use. Some of the ones they used not too long ago were not too hard to break. In fact, Dr. Yuan had an interesting class, a lab assignment. She gave everybody a little bit of router, wireless router, and said, okay, crack the address. And you could, you know, crack the encryption. Apparently. It was sent encryption, encrypted messages, and you could figure out to break the encryption. It's kind of slick. But they've gone to better encryption algorithms. The biggest problem we have is people think, oh, this little bitty computer cannot do heavy duty encryption. You know, they could have used AES encryption anywhere, no problem. No, we'll think of this cheap, simpler encryption that's faster for it to execute. And of course, it's also faster for them to break. If they had just accepted the fact that the computers are pretty capable. And I remember reading a paper shortly after somebody came out with one of these standards for uh, wireless. Somebody did a study and said, you know, you can use AES. They made their computer do AES and it works just perfectly well. Of course, it's so much more secure, but yeah, things get going and companies are doing these things, pushing these standards forward before anybody goes, that's pretty stupid. Well, okay. Yes, it was an academic who was saying, that's stupid, we should do it the other way. They didn't have millions of dollars to push for today. Okay, well, anyway, so, you can poison a computer by app by sending an app, an, excuse me, an ARP reply saying, I am this address. And in fact, it's not that address. Now, Internet Protocol version six, uh, version four was very popular and lasted for a long time. We've now, for the last decade or more, been converting slowly over to version six. Many systems use version four, uh, some use versions by default. Microsoft Windows uses version six. If you are connected to another computer on your network, in other words, at my home, if I wanna send a message from my computer to my wife's computer, by default, Microsoft will use IP version six. If you send it off to the internet, it uses IP version four because my router and my internet service provider generally support version four, not version six. Uh, but version six has the secure neighbor discovery protocol, SEND or SEND protocol. And it is more secure and doesn't allow for the equivalent of our poisoning. 
Now, your MAC address identifies your device. For a lot of them, it's built right in. For wireless devices, it's, you know, as you wander around, uh, different systems can connect you and send packets to your hardware address as you connect. Of course, that means they know where you are. And in fact, yes, everybody knows where you are. Um, it's here now, Edward Snowden, if you remember Snowden, released a whole bunch of files from, from the NSA. He worked for the National Security Agency and then uh, released them to WikiLeaks. Eventually he ran to different countries. He's now in Russia. Uh, but he released a lot of information. In some sense, it was eye-opening that he did so. I mean, yes, he violated all sorts of sense of trust. Now the American people know more about what the NSA was doing. And they said, so. well, it turns out, everybody knows where your internet service providers know where you are. Google keeps track of where you are. All sorts of places know where you are. There's a, there was an interesting article in oh, one of the many journals I get, whose name I don't remember, but it said, no, location security is so cheap, so plentiful. There's no reason to, you, know, you can't hardly charge for it. You can't hardly uh, protect against it. It's all over the place. Google knows where you are all the time. Uh, so one of the things they can, you can do to help prevent, you know, the NSA or is they have a random address. So that is your, map, your wireless system does not have to always use the same address. It can randomly make a MAC address. So as you go to different places, you get different MAC addresses. And then the NSA doesn't know who you are because with a fixed MAC address, you go, oh, that's this device. We can learn who has that device and therefore we know where they are. In case you know, don't want to know that sort of stuff. And I suppose if you're tracking terrorists in the city, you might want to know that sort of stuff. If you're tracking Joe Average Citizen, it's a different situation. Uh, now, sometimes you want to track people. There are child tracking systems. You can put a tracking software on your child's uh, cell phone, and then you can find out where is the kid, uh, in case you want to know that. Um, and those, in order to keep some sense of anonymity, you can uh, use a hash of the MAC address. And all the hash addresses don't go backwards, we talked about those, and then they use a hash, so they keep track of this hash and find out where it is. Okay. Uh, Internet names. You talked about hardware names. Let's talk about internet names. Uh, internet names again come in different. Uh, our English. You, you've seen lots of these things. You know, at the right hand side, the uh, rightmost part defines the type of network you have, and it can be dot, dot edu. So you, uh, by the way, names are case insensitive. They can be upper and lower case. It doesn't matter. Some people always think you have to capitalize. No, you don't. You don't have to capitalize it, it doesn't make any difference. When it finally gets down to converting it to an IP address, it doesn't care about capitalization. And the internet names are assigned by this organization, although there are all sorts of companies that will interface with ICANN for you and charge you for that service. Here's a small list of just some of the domain names, that is the rightmost name. We know EDU for education, Gov for government, uh, mil for military, at or for organizations. There's a uh, name. You can get your own website. You use a dot name. Um, and country codes. It's also important to note there are many country codes using the postal, the two digit postal code for that country. Uh, so I think CA is Canada. Uh, I think CH is China. DU is Germany. DU for Germany, you may ask. Ah, Germans don't call it. It's Deutschland. So it's DU. Anyway, uh, yes. Uh, most places, well, a lot of places use country codes. The United States generally doesn't. Although the public school system, I know, know uses a something.guilford.nc.us ad, uh, uh, address. Okay, domain name servers are used for mapping between 
the English, well, the alphanumeric names and the IP addresses. So uh, again, your domain name servers typically are on your network. In fact, every network with a separate domain has to have a domain name server. So a requirement for being a domain. So if you own a network, like your company might have a network here at AT, we have a network, and therefore we must have a domain name server. We actually have a couple of them because you often want to have backups in case the first one breaks or something. You can continue to communicate. Your internet service providers all have domain name servers. So when the customers use their network, one of the services they provide besides the connection is the domain name server. And basically, it's got a database of names. It's, you send a IP name to the server, looks it up its database, and sends the address back if it knows the address, because obviously not every domain name server knows every one of the zillions of names out there. And there is a recursive system for asking another domain name server, which asks the other domain server until you find the answer. They are hierarchical, We're kind of going right to left, starting with the domain type the .com. There are, there's a server out there, a .com server, who knows all of the domain name servers for all of the networks, the domains. There's one for EDU, there's one for museum, there's one for mill, uh, uh, probably several, by the way, there, there are several, this is back, there are multiple copies of this. So if one becomes unavailable, you can connect to the others. So if we have peanut.candy.foobar.com, that's you. So you find the dot com, the column says you can find foobar addresses here, so you can find the candy address that knows about that. Okay, here's how a domain name server search works. Imagine you're here at a and at me.ncat.edu, and you want to find the IP address for www.acme.com. By the way, there is really a www.acme.com. I don't know. It's just a nice name. Roadrunner told me to use it. Okay, so. Uh, if you want your computer wants to know the IP address, you send a request to the ANT domain name server. Now, the domain name server may not know the address of the IP address, so it sends a request up to the root. It says, where can I find the .com? And so it sends a reply back, tells it where the .com is. So you send a reply to the .com and says, where is www.acme.com? It says, I don't know. Go ask the domain name server for the acme.com uh, domain. And so you send a request to the domain name server on the acme.com, it sends you back the answer. Now you know the IP address, which you give back to, you, to your computer. So it's repeating, going back to progressive networks to find the address. Addresses are cached, a kind of an expensive operation. So once your computer finds the IP address for a system, it saves it. In, in the memory of your computer. So if you want to send another packet there, you don't bother looking it up, you just get it off your list and use it again. Also the same thing for ARP addresses. Those are saved. If you get a, you need to know a hardware address, once you do the ARP protocol and find it, you save it. Basic concept of caching is if something was expensive to get, you save it someplace where you can get to it quickly. And that's what's done for both MAC addresses and IP addresses. So let's say after having gone to www.acme.com, your computer wants to go to ftp.acme.com. So you send a request to your domain name server saying, I, I want to get to FTP. You send it to your local one because you always connect to your local one. Your local one, so I don't know that name, but it knows the domain name server for acme.com. You just asked it a little while ago. So it saved the information. So it doesn't have to go searching for that. It's remembered the main name server for acme.com, sends the message directly to that one, which replies, how do you get the FTP, which you then sends the address back to the requester. So again, saving things in memory of these systems makes the process much faster. Now, uh, when they first built the main name servers, what was that back in 1983 uh, or something I said? Uh, they didn't think about security too much. Originally, ARPANET, the, uh, the internet 
had a small number of computers. It was just academics and government computers connected. There were no commercial computers connected to the internet. That's not the purpose of the internet when it was built. It was just mostly for academics to send information back and forth and to send it to funding agencies and the government and so forth. So they didn't think too much about security. That was a big mistake. So a computer that can masquerade as a domain name server can send false information to a domain name server. The domain name server puts it into its cache because now it's got an address. And so the next time somebody wants to send something to that address, it gives it what is now the false address. This was done a few years ago, took out the northeast portion of the United States. The domain name servers there just spread out uh, Google, Amazon, they were offline. Well, if you were connected to them, you were okay. If you've been sitting there on your computer buying stuff on Amazon, you can just keep doing it because you don't have to go to the domain name server anymore. But if you turned on your laptop, went to connect to Amazon, it wasn't there anymore. Amazon thought that to be a significant problem. So, you know, I can't remember how many millions of dollars a minute, but lots of money. Okay, so another clicker question for everyone. All right, whole question. Okay. 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 Let's see. Two thirds of the folks online. Ooh, seventy-five percent. They're moving fast. Okay. Let's see here. Oh. Okay. Get the cards up. Don't have the card. Oh, okay. you don't have a card. Let me get your card in a minute here. All right. Okay. Uh, most people got it. It's, uh, yes, the correct answer is converts IP names to IP addresses. Sorry, I'm not going to make it seem like that. All right. Uh, stop that. Okay, again, you got it right. Everybody, most people are paying attention. Now, because the domain name servers are risky, there's domain name servers, me, DNS security extensions. Uh, the security extensions are updates, it's an add on to the DNS software that makes it more secure. It uses digital signatures. Let's use the regular, you know, public key infrastructure that we've talked about before to sign things. And so when you send a packet to another side, it goes, yes, this actually came from that domain name server and not from somebody falsifying it. So uh, it keeps the thing much more secure. Okay, moving on to a slightly different topic. The difference between connection-oriented and connectionless protocols. We've got a bunch of probably already talked about no, ARP and or no, we will talk about some, but connection oriented is something that when you start it, it makes a connection and then you talk to that user or, actually, or that other computer. You're done talking to that computer, you close the connection and you're done. Connectionless is you just send a packet there and the computer receives it, hopefully, and there's no promise of another packet. You send another packet someplace else, what do you want to? I like the analogy of a phone call and a letter. A phone call is connection oriented. You dial up, which is of course putting the address into the system and it connects to the other user. And then you talk to the other user. You know what I use the word dial, of course, I don't have dials. Phones haven't had dials for decades, but it's terminology. I actually have a dial phone at home in the closet. Uh, Okay, so again, you make a connection, you talk to them, as you're talking, nobody else hears it, hopefully, and when you hang up, you're done. A letter is connectionless. You write a letter, you put the address on it, you send it off in the mail, and then it arrives. You can send a bunch of letters, they go to different places, 
Uh, you can send a bunch of letters to the same place. Some may get there, some may never get there. Oh, the pride of Greensboro is now postmaster general. Uh, but yeah, some of them may never get there and they may arrive out of order, which is what happens with network packets too. Uh, so again, it's connectionless and telephones. The internet protocol, which of course is the basis for the internet and does the routing of internet packets is a connectionless best effort packet network. Uh, it uses the internet addresses, those 32 bit addresses to route things around the network. It does not guarantee that the packet will get there. It does not guarantee that it will get there uncorrupted, that thing of bits may get changed, it may arrive out of order, or may get lost, something. Uh, so it try, it sends, now it tries to get it there, but it may or may not get there. That's not its concern. If it doesn't get there, it doesn't try to fix that problem. It just makes an effort to send it there. By the way, usually most of the time what causes packets to be lost is oh, overflow and networks get so busy that they can't handle another packet. Another one comes in, doesn't know what to do with it. So it just drops it and that's how they get lost. Okay. When you use an internet address, uh, there is a port involved. You see it when you, does this work? Yeah. Uh, there's a, you can put a name, colon, port, so there are 16-bit so numbers. 16 bits means the number between zero and something like 65,000 something. That tells you what application on the receiving computer is going to deal with this data. So everything with the same internet address goes to that computer. But of course, there's more than one thing connected to the network. You might have a couple browser pages open, or like my wife, a couple dozen browser pages open at any one time. Uh, you could have your email. You could have all these things happening at once. And they're all going to this, you know, things coming back to your computer all coming to the same address, but to different port numbers. Everyone has a different port. It is the number that identifies where it goes. Don't get confused. The port can, talks about some plug on the back of the machine. No, it's just a number in a packet that says, what am I supposed to do with this packet? And so when an application is going to do a connecting, it binds to a particular port. It tells the operating system, I want to use this port number. And then if anything comes in to that port, it gives it to that application. Uh, again, you can see the port number follows the name and the URL. There's the port number. Now, there are some well-known port numbers. The first 2000, 2000 or 4000, well, it was 2000. I think they've up to 4000 ports now, what they call well-known, that is particular applications have been assigned particular port numbers. For instance, HTTP is assigned port 80. HTTPS, the secure version is assigned to port 443. I think Telnet's port 21. FTP is port 23. I will not quiz you on the port numbers on a test, but quiz you. You know, certain applications have different numbers. Now, there are multiple protocols running across the internet. On top of the internet protocol, there's two major protocols that operate. There's TCP, and everybody knows about TCP IP, as if it's five letters. Sometimes written TCP slash IP, which is more appropriate because it's the TCP protocol operating on top of the IP protocol. And IPs level three, the network, and TCP is a transport layer are level four. So the TCP requires the IP to do the network routing. And then there's UDP, user datagram protocol. The user datagram protocol sits on top of IP and provides almost no functionality at all. But it's very efficient at doing nothing. So it's often used when you want efficiency. And, uh, they are significantly different. TCP is connection oriented. When you first start a TCP connection, you send these SYN packets and the other side sends a SYN act. And we talked about the SYN floods when you screw that up. Uh, UDP doesn't do that. UDP just sends it. You want a packet, you just send it to the guy. You don't have to connect. You just send the, send the data. Uh, TCP uh, works hard to get the packets there reliably. It, it checks for corruption for any errors in the packet. It checks and sees if anything comes out of order, if any packets are lost. It's pretty easy. It just numbers all the packets. And it expects to get you know packet two, packet three, packet four, 
If it gets a packet six, it goes, whoa, what happened to packet five? Sends a message back to the other side saying, I didn't get five. And then a uh, waste gets five, it gets six. If later it gets five, because you know they could come out of order and be delayed, but, ah, I've already got that one. Throw that one out. So it could, uh, UDP, UDP just sends the packet and again, it provides no functionality. So IP tries to get it there. If it gets there, good. If it doesn't get there, fine. Which works pretty well. A lot of times, you just, if you're sending a packet on a local area network, it almost gets to 99.999% of the time it gets there because the local area network is quite reliable. So you don't have to worry about it. Besides, sometimes if you don't get an answer in a few milliseconds or whatever it is you want, ask again. Full duplex, that means they work in both directions. You can send and receive with the same connection. TCP is point to point. That is one computer makes a connection to another computer. UDP, you can do that too, or you can do, I can broadcast one to many. I can send many things, sending things to one, many to many. You can just, whatever address you put on that packet, it goes out, you can get them back. Uh, TCP is stream interface, and that is, when you program it, you set, give it a bunch of bytes to send, and it just streams them all together and sends them. With UDP, you send, give it a packet. So I want to send this packet, it sends the packet. With TCP, you never think about the packets. That's below the TCP level. You just give it bytes, and it packets them for you and sends them off. And again, when you start up, it develops a reliable connection. UDP it doesn't do a connection, it just doesn't. TCP is uh, very popular for HTTP or HTTPS. It's used by the web, so it's very popular. And you want the stuff to get there reliably. Anytime you want the stuff to get there reliably, then uh, TCP is what they use. Telnet, FTP, they will all use TCP. Uh, UDP, UDP is used for domain name server requests because it's short. You just send one packet there. And in fact, in the DNS packet, there's a checksum at the end to make sure it got there correctly. Uh, and since you can send the entire packet, the entire DNS request in one packet, just sends a request. And if you don't hear anything back in a few milliseconds, you send it again. Uh, streaming audio. Now, streaming audio, you might think you want a reliable connection, but reliability takes performance to do that. If a packet gets lost, it usually figures that out because it didn't get it out. You send a packet, the other side sends you an acknowledgement, I got the packet. Uh, usually, of course, you send packets ahead of time, so you're sending packets two, three, four, five, and you're waiting for acknowledgements for packet two, packet three, packet four, packet five. You send two, three, four, five, and you get acknowledgements for two for acknowledgement for three. You don't get an acknowledgement for four. You go, oh, didn't get there, send it again. Of course, it may have got there and the acknowledgement didn't get back, but yeah, so you send it again. But that timeout resend is problematic for real time activities, video and audio. Because if you have these gaps and audio, oh, it's kind of annoying. So you've seen it. So in order to smooth that out, they use UDP to get it there without, if something gets lost, if one packet, which only holds a couple of milliseconds worth of sound, it's lost, it drops out, it plays silence instead, and your ear hardly notices at all. You could actually lose a whole bunch of packets before you start to notice. Yeah. You probably start to notice way before I do with my ears that are probably 40, 50 years older than yours. Keep trying to sell me high definition quality audio. What do I care? I can't tell the difference. Uh, so, yeah, so that's why. That's UDP. UDP is very popular, although TCP, of course, is the bulk of the traffic. In addition to UDP and TCP, there's ICMP, the control message protocol. And that's for controlling how the network runs. It does all sorts of things. Uh, we talked about the ping, but that's ICPM message. You just, it's an echo request. Send a packet there, it sends it back to you. you got it. Uh, the uh, TTL, that's time to live. When you send a packet, you put a number in the time to live, and every time it goes through a router or a next hop, it subtracts that one from that number. When that number gets down to zero, it goes, oh, this is lost. It keeps things from wandering the internet forever. And when it gets down to zero, it goes lost, and then sends a message back, an ICMP message back saying, uh, this packet didn't get to where it was supposed to go, something's wrong. Uh, the important thing here, 
redirect the, the host to a better router. If your network has multiple routers, if, you, if you're going out to network A or going out to network B, if you're on network C and you get a request for something on C and your system sends it to, to the router that goes to A, it goes, oh, oh, no, that's, don't go there. Go to the other one. And it'll send an ICMP message back telling you, oh, don't send it to me, send it to the other router. It's a better choice. Now, it's the network recovers best effort. If you send it to the wrong router, the wrong router will send it to the proper router. Fine, that works. But it's telling you if it's on your network, you can speed things up by sending it to the right router in the first place. Sends an ICMP message. There's all sorts of things. The rate at which you send stuff and other things. Of course, if you screw that up, you can screw up the network. Uh, this is, uh, there's also another protocol which I'm not talking about today, which is network control message protocol, NCMP. Uh, that's used for controlling things. Uh, you can send messages to devices which you can't usually see, like repeaters and bridges and routers. And you can send a message to the bridge and say, how are you doing? Everything going okay? And it will send tell you how many packets it's seen. And so you can tell if it didn't get any packets over the last hour, you go, yeah, that's just unprobable. Something's broken. In fact, you usually pull these things frequently and find out when things are break. Uh, but ICMP is used by regular computers to control things. You don't want somebody sending redirection when they should. Typically, uh, many network routers do not forward ICMP packets. Here on campus, you can ping another computer that's on your local network, but you can't ping another computer that's not on your local network. If you're here, uh, McNair Hall, you can ping another computer in McNair Hall. You can't ping a computer over, uh, well, probably not even Cherry Hall. It even seems close because it goes to a router and the router will not pass ICMP packets because that could cause problems. Come to another uh, polling question. Let's ask this one. Okay, let's go. Maybe, come on, press the button. All right, good. Uh, all right. The answer is B. Uh, TCP is connection oriented. Uh, there are a lot of answers. There are a lot of answers for uh, uh, all of the above, but no, only TCP is connected. IP and UDP are packet oriented. Okay. Uh, I think we talked about transport layer security earlier. Uh, basically, transport layer security uh, is used by HTTPS. It's relatively straightforward. It starts off using uh, asymmetric encryption or public encryption, usually RSA, sends a request to the other side for a key, which encrypts it with its certificate with a public key, sends it back. Now they've shared RSA, or excuse me, AES keys, and they communicate, the rest of it communicates over AES. Remember that AES is symmetric key is much faster than RSA. Also, by using RSA to start with, they send certificates, the client, can authenticate that the server is in fact who they claim to be. If you're gonna to connect to www.acme.com and it sends back a pack, a certificate, the certificate should include that it's www.acme.com. If it's not, you shouldn't accept it. Okay. Firewalls. Uh, firewalls are devices that are used to filter packets. They're used to keep unauthorized packets out of your network. In this example, we've got the wild internet out there. And then it connects to a uh, firewall to your local network over here. So all your local networks go through your router. Often they are, I guess this has a router in the middle. It's firewalls are sometimes built into a router. Uh, they can be hardware or software. A lot of firewalls are so hardware boxes for uh, commercial. A&T has some advanced firewalls to 
because they do high level uh, checking and it requires considerable time. It is a performance impact on the network, but it's also significant uh, security advantage. Uh, I save it. I sacrifice a few milliseconds for security. They operate at different layers. You can do packet filtering because what is the network address? What is the IP address? Uh, what protocol we're using in the transport layer? Are we going to allow TCP, UDP, ICMP? Application layer is it a request to a browser? Are we doing email? Are we doing FTP? Uh, and then there's NAT and proxy service, which we'll talk about shortly. Uh, so a simple firewall is just a packet filter. Packets come in. It looks at its set of rules. Does this packet allow? Is this packet allowed to go to the other side? If it is, it goes. If it's not, it drops it. Doesn't tell the other side it's dropping. It just doesn't send it forward. It doesn't meet the requirements. Now, with a connection-oriented network, you got to be able to allow it. So, if something, if you make a request to www.activate.com, your request goes out through the firewall. The firewall has to go, oh, you're trying to connect to acme.com. And so when acme.com sends a packet back to you, it's going to say, okay, that's all right. We expect acme.com to be sending you a packet for this port, and it will allow it to go through. So it has to keep track of what connections are out there. And again, you can filter on all sorts of things. You can filter on the source address. Remembering, of course, that it is possible to forge the source address from where it's coming from. So you could fake that if you're trying to get through a firewall. Uh, destination address, you're going to sort filter based on where it's supposed to go. Is this supposed to go to my web server or is it supposed to go to my database system? I mean, I might happily let this request from the internet go to my web server. I'm not too happy to let it go to my database. And then port numbers, remember UDP and TCP are port numbers that 16-bit numbers saying what application I want to go to. And then what protocol? This is a UDP packet, a TCP packet, ICMP packet, whatever something, something P packet I have. Application filtering is the most advanced. It's the upper level. It's going to look at it and see, is this packet effective for this type of protocol? Is this, well, you can go through and say, is this email uh, spam or is this email contain some sort of phishing attack or something malicious? So they scan the, the text, the email message. That's, has a, that's application letter email firewall. I think I just covered this when you make a connection, of course. It has to, that doesn't apply to UDP, which doesn't make connections. You have to configure firewalls. Now, some parts of the network automatically configure themselves, not so with firewalls. You have to tell it what you want to allow in, what you want to allow out. Who can you connect? Sometimes they put firewalls to keep things from going out. Uh, companies might put firewalls up so you uh, can't watch the game uh, from work and stuff like that. Or at least maybe not before five o'clock, something you know, that's, that happens. Uh, all sorts of interface how it's done. Uh, Again, firewalls are like perimeter protection. They are, as you can imagine, a wall around your network that keeps packets from coming in or going out without the proper authorization. A DMZ, which stands for Demilitarized Zone, as the militaries have areas between two unhappy nations. So you, you, nobody, you know, nobody goes in between here and you know, side A is on one, side B is on the other and nobody's in the middle, or maybe the UN or something's in the middle. There are also DMZ countries, parts of countries, Slavberg, uh, up, way up north, has no, not allowed to have any military from anybody. Neither is the Antarctic. They're demilitarized. Area. Anyway, for networks, DMZs are usually outside of your firewall, can, or you might have multiple firewalls, you're coming to the network, you go through one firewall that allows you into your domain, excuse me, actually, into your internet web server. So customers can get to your web. Then you have another firewall that goes to your internal network. Because you're happy to let the customers connect to your web, but you don't want them wandering around through the details of your 
uh, internal network looking at your files. So you keep your things that are available to the public uh, in the DMZ area, someplace outside of your trusted network that you allow the public to get into. There are many ways to configure firewalls. Windows got one, Cisco has another. If I can pull it together, we'll talk about Cisco firewall connections on Monday, but uh, otherwise we'll continue with the scheme. Uh, and you can specify here that what is allowed, no, what network are you going to allow you to connect to? What ones will you prohibit? What protocols, port numbers, and stuff like that are you going to allow? You can also say, hey, I want, even though normally this sort of packet is allowed, I want to prohibit it from this particular uh, application. Yeah, like Microsoft sticky notes. Yeah, what the blazes are sticky notes doing, sending messages out? If I put a sticky note on my desktop, I don't want anybody else knowing about it. What is, what is Microsoft doing, sending that sticky note data to somebody else? Okay, Big Brother is watching. Uh, now, the problem with firewalls, you're there to filter out a bad packet, but sometimes it's not so easy to, see, to know a bad packet when you see one. That was also a problem we talked about, sin floods. Sometimes it's very difficult to tell the good from the bad. Uh, that, by the way, is also part of life. Uh, so you can still get the flooding problems where things are uh, I think I mentioned email filtering. There's a lot of bad stuff out there. Now it's gotten a little bit better. Somebody measured right, in 2007, 97% of all the emails were junk. And now they say it's down to 66%. Uh, my personal experience does not indicate that one third of the emails were worthwhile. Uh, but again, what's a bad email? There's malicious emails and then there's spam. And spam is kind of in the eye of the beholder. Companies send me stuff because I have done something with the company. If I bought something from that company, then they think I want to buy more and more and more. So they continue to send me ads. And at first it was useful, but now it's annoying. And by the way, you know, the two answers are you can filter them out with your firewall or your email system or, or browsers and drop them, or you can try to unsubscribe. Because remember, unsubscribing is going to their website and clicking a button, which could be dangerous in itself. Um, yes, and uh, 2010, which is 10 year, 12 years ago, uh, 2 billion spam messages a day. So they're clogging up the network. Okay, another way you can keep your network safe is network address translation or NAT, N-A-T. It maps internal addresses to external addresses. In other words, your NAT device, which is often incorporated into a router, your router connects to the internet and the internet only sees one address for your whole network. But as things come in, Say you're sending a message from your computer. You're going to go out and connect at www.acme.com again. So you send a packet to your router. Your router then changes your internal address to an address that the router uses with a separate port number. It keeps a table of all these ports. I'm now using lots of ports. And when something comes in for that port, it goes, oh, that's supposed to go to the me.ncat.edu network and routes to, you, to your network. There are specific addresses on Ethernet. Excuse me, that would be Internet. And I say, I say Ethernet there. That should be Internet protocol addresses. That's that's incorrect. Who who made that mistake? I, I did. Uh, okay, but there are certain ones that are local addresses only. Those one ninety two one sixty eight dot anything dot anything. Those are addresses that only appear on internal networks. They never appear on the Internet. It's on the internet, it's a mistake. And then there's the uh, 172.16 uh, and the 10. anything. So depends on the size of the networks. And so those are internal addresses. They can then uh, use those and they go out and they go through a NAT which converts them to something else. So we have a, here at a and if you look at any local address, you'll see that there are 192.168 addresses. So a and got can support 65,000 different addresses. 
and they all go out. Uh, the, the router, which always identifies everything that's coming from one particular address, when things come back in, they can then translate it back. So people from the outside have no idea what our network looks like. They don't know what anybody's local machine address is. They don't know how they're connected. It's all hidden behind the network address translation, which maps addresses down to one. That also allows you to have a lot more addresses in the world. 32-bit IP address. Well, remember 32-bit numbers at 2.14 billion something. So there's only 2.14 billion different unique addresses. I remember there's close to 8 billion people in the, in the world. And of course, by the way, you can't actually use all 2.14 billion addresses, but there's lots of it. There's, everybody can't have their address. Everybody's building internet of things, little devices that are going all over the place now, each have their own internet address. So you're gonna need more than 2.14 billion. That's where NAT comes in. It really helps hide a whole bunch of them behind a network address, address translation. And so the internet looks like one address when in fact, it may be thousands of devices. Also, internet protocol version six uses 128 bit addresses instead of using 32-bit. 128 bit is a big number. And hopefully uh, you won't have that problem. Uh, I'm gonna skip this question and go right on to my distributed denial of service. And some of those, they're kind of interesting. Uh, two years ago, somebody hit Google addresses and it was a lot of less six months. And at the peak, they were sending 2.5 terabits per second. Remember, you know, you have kilo, mega, uh, giga, tera. So uh, gigas, billions, so those are trillions, 2.5 trillion bits per second. That's an awful lot of garbage going on in the network. And that did have an impact on, against Google, but they kept on going. Somebody also attacked uh, Amazon Web Services. Amazon Web Services is a cloud company. They provide cloud services and they provide web servers for a lot of people. A lot of, a lot of web servers are in fact, not on companies independent machine, they're on Amazon Web Server because they support it, they got the power, they've got the people to make it work. Uh, and they got hit for three days and they peaked at 2.3 terab terabits per second. And again, this one attack impacted many companies because AWS supports web servers for lots of folks. This is an interesting chart for a GitHub attack a couple of years ago. Uh, notice the traffic is just crawling along there. And all of a sudden, at 5.28 in the afternoon, it just zings up there from almost nothing up to 1.35 terabits per second. This is a distributed denial of service attack. Lots of computers are sitting here. And it lasted only for about nine minutes and then went back to where it was. Somebody tried to hit them hard. Okay, that's it for today. I remind you that uh, registration is Monday, uh, next, next Monday. You should see your advisor to register. Uh, and I always recommend that you register as soon as you can. Now, it doesn't make as much difference as a graduate student because most of the graduate classes don't fill up. Although this one's overfull, but I take that back. I let some people into this. This class overfilled and I foolishly even let more students in. So yes, uh, they do fill up. So, but if you're early, it's a first come first serve. So if you register early in the morning on Monday, October 31st, you're gonna get the classes you want. And it's even more important for undergrads who sometimes have to compete and you wanna make sure you get the times you want, the classes you want. So do it early and be careful about prerequisites. That's it for today. Any other uh, questions, comments, thoughts? So, See you next time. No, no, no comments. All right.